All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to CS 2050. This is the third week, it's on a Tuesday. The topic of today is elementary set theory. Set theory is, in some sense, uh, every theory and the only theory. Everything is set theory. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, more in depth uh, next time. In some sense, there is nothing if not, only, if not a set. Everything is a set. Um, so it's important that you understand set theory, especially in a, in a discrete math course. A set is simply a, a, a collection of items. You have a set of things. A set is uh, a box, a grouping of elements. So we denote a set using this notation. We use an open bracket, and we use a closed bracket to denote the beginning and the end of a set. Um, for example... Uh, the set containing 2 and 3 is a set. And this is the notation we use for a set. This is a set. A set this set, for example, has two items in it, uh, or also called elements. Um, we say, for example, if E is an element uh, and S is a set, we write uh, E, and then this symbol, which is also an E, uh, S to mean E is an element of S, or E is an element. Now, the elements could be over some specified universe of discourse. They could be numbers, they could be apples, they could themselves be sets. Um, for example, we may write two is an element of the set containing two and three. That's what we, the way we would use this uh, element of symbol. This E, it's a special kind of, has a special curve to it, right? It's not necessarily a generic E. Uh, we may also write not an element of, for example, four is not an element of the set containing two comma three. So we may write the element of symbol with the strike through to mean, and this is red, 4 is not an element of uh, 2 comma 3, right? Um, what else? Uh, 2 comma 2 comma 3 is not a set. A set does not contain duplicate items. This is technically called a multi-set. That's only something that computer scientists care about and not mathematicians. There, a set with, with duplicate elements is not a set, right? Um, every element E comes from some universe of discourse, right? So E, we may write, to, be, to belong to the universe of discourse, we may say it's an element of this capital omega, and omega means the universe of discourse. Any questions so far? Sort of hit the ground running in, in some of the notation. Today's mostly electro notation. Just to know, I mean, again, mathematics is a language you have to learn to speak to other people. Uh, set theory is the lingua franca. Everything is in set theory in some sense. Um, we may use uh, ellipsis to denote large collections of sets. So, for example, 1, 2, 99, 100. This is a set, and this dot, dot, dot here, and it should be exactly three dots, symbolizes... Uh, a continuance of a pattern between uh, those two, right? One, two, skip a few, 99, 100. So what does, uh, how many elements are in this set? Zero. Yes, this set contains 100 elements. One, two, uh, let's, we could even write, for example, 17 is an element of this set, right? Just some examples. Uh, what about the set uh, two, comma, four, comma, six, comma, dot, 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 comma, 100, right? So the pattern may not literally be, you know, plus one or something. How many elements are in this set? 50. There's, sorry, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, 50. 50, right. It's literally half the elements of the set, right? So we may say 17, for example, is odd. It's not an element of that set. Pretty simple so far. Now here's the cool part. Sets can be infinite. That's kind of... Uh, really important. In, in some contexts, the only useful sets are the infinite ones. Uh, so we may write the natural numbers with this big capital N 
uh, to be the set containing 0, 1, 2, this way. We mean denote an unbounded ellipsis to mean an infinite sequence, right? So the set con the naturals are simply the set containing uh, 0, 1, and 2, right? That one, I think, is obvious. What about the, uh, the integers? We denote the integers again by capital Z, and we do negative 2, negative 1. Excuse me. This one is infinite in two ways, right? Uh, 0, 1, 2. That's what the uh, integers are, right? So it goes infinite, uh, negative infinity, and then to positive infinity, right? Um, we may denote either the positive naturals or the positive integers with the n or z with a little plus. And we denote this as the set beginning with 1, 2, like that. So it's the naturals without 0. Same thing. If someone says, let n be a positive integer, you know it's not 0 because 0 is not positive. right? It's simply a whole number greater than, zero, greater than equal to 1. Um, how many elements are in the set uh, in the set? None. This is called the empty set. And we denote it by this special symbol, which is a zero with a strike through with it, kind of dramatically. Uh, the empty set, in some sense, exists. It is the only set of no elements. And it's very important. It's kind of uh, like a little base case for everything. You know, the empty set exists, and it contains no elements. You should know that's what it's called, right? Um, right. So we were able to talk about, last time we mentioned universes of discourse, and we sort of said, well, we'll have to talk about set theory to really define these, and that's what they are. A universe of discourse is simply a set. It's a collection of objects. Uh, themselves can be sets. And um, when you, the, the, the universe of discourse of any you know, predicate or propositional formula or any proof or anything is going to be a set. It's defined in terms of sets. Any questions so far on these just basic uh, things? Again, this is just early definitions in, into things. So you sh I would expect you to have some questions so far. A set is not necessarily orderable, or orderable either, right? So uh, 2 comma 3 is equal to 3 comma 2. It's not about the order or the way you write them in. And there are certain sets that you can't necessarily write in good order. For example, consider the rational numbers. Um, we know the rational numbers are uh, the fractions, right? The, the, the ratios of things. But we can't exactly write them with the, this, this ellipse notation because we don't know what, what is the first rational number. Kind of tricky question. What is the second rational number? It's not so obvious. What the first number is and the second number is, that's kind of easy. It's just one and two. But what about the, what is the third rational number? Like what order would you write them in? Uh, it's, not, it's not totally obvious. But instead we can define something called set builder notation. And this is much more common. Set builder notation is you define a set according to a specified predicate. So the set builder notation is written like this. X is in a universe of discourse such that 5x. And it's read this way as well. X is in a universe of discourse. You put a bar, and then you put some predicate here. And the predicate is not necessarily you know, P implies Q, but it could be a set of conditions. It could even contain human words, human words English, uh, in the predicate to specify what exactly does that predicate mean. This thing that comes before the bar is def defining the syntax of the object as well as its universe of discourse, right? This is called set builder notation. This is how you can specify uh, a large class of objects that may not necessarily be written with an ellipse, dot, dot, dot. It's not easy to write every object that way, right? But still, you can define a set of objects such that the, th the elements in this set are exactly those that, that which satisfy this predicate, whatever it is. For example, Suppose we were defined to define the rationals, we would write A over B such that A and B are elements of the integers and B does not equal zero. This is the rationals. That is how you would use set builder notation to define the rational numbers. 
right? So we define here in the prefix. Sometimes you can leave the uh, universal discourse off um, if the context is clear. But you can also define the syntax of what the object should look like here. It's a graph, a function. It's a set. It's a number, whatever it is. Here, it's a ratio of numbers with the line through, with the line to separate them. That's the way we represent it, right? Uh, and we specify the conditions here. A and B are themselves uh, integers, but B does not equal 0. This is then the set of rational numbers, right? Question so far? Set builder notation? All right. Let's say we did some more examples. What is n is a natural subject to 1 strictly uh, less than n strictly less than 10? Right. That is the set of natural numbers between uh, 2 and 9 inclusive, or 1 and 10 exclusive. So it doesn't contain 1, and it doesn't contain 10, but it contains all the numbers that are between uh, 2 and 9 inclusive. Right. What about um, n is a real number conditioned on that n is a natural, uh, or negative n is a natural? This is a little tricky. What is this set of numbers? Zeros. Zero? Zero is an element there, correct. Zero is in the set. What else is in the set? The integers. The integers. Two is in the set because two is a natural. Uh, negative two is also in the set because negative negative 2 is 2. So it's all the naturals and the negations of the naturals. All the naturals and the naturals times negative 1. It's the integers. It's another way you could write the integers. right? What about um, uh, r? This, hard to write with set builder notation. This is like, I just want to, uh, you know, because we're defining all the universes of discourse, we did the naturals, we did the rationals, we did the integers. We, of course, have to describe the reals. How do you write the reals using set builder notation? This is, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, is hard. To write the, the, the reals using set builder notation takes, like, an entire class, like a 4,000-level math class. What is a real number? What should be the real numbers? This is actually a very involved question. Um, it's not polite to write it using set builder notation because there's not an easy way to do it without taking literally an entire class to define what a real number is. In practice, a real number is one with any decimal expansion, including an infinite decimal expansion, right? Every real number can be written almost uniquely with an infinite decimal expansion. Um, so we'll just sort of leave that one off. But then we can define the complex numbers without that. The complex numbers are those of the form a plus bi subject to a comma b are real numbers. Right? A and B are themselves real numbers. And then I would also say, like, I squared is negative 1. Right? Again, you define the syntax of the objects of the elements of the set. Then you just say the specification. Right? Um, given the complex numbers, it's actually easy to define the real numbers. Uh, but you usually don't define the complex numbers. You define the complex numbers from the real numbers. So you can't define the complex numbers if you don't have a definition of the real numbers. But assuming you had a definition of the complex numbers, you can actually define uh, the real numbers. You can say the real numbers are that which are complex with imaginary part 0. Uh, a plus bi is, an, is a complex number. And b uh, is equal to 0. Right? That's technically a circular definition. Because C is defined in terms of R, and R here is defined in terms of C. So this is not a definition of the real numbers, but it is a way you could write it out. Every, every, real no, every complex number with imaginary part 0 is simply a real number then. Right? You may have been dealing with sets and not really realized it. Uh, 
you may be familiar with interval notation. The open interval A, B is actually, is, is part of the real line from A to B, not including A and B themselves, right? But this is actually a set of points of the real line. So this is actually defined to be x is an element of R subject to A strictly less than x, strictly less than B, right? That's the open interval. The closed and the partially open and partially closed intervals, x is an element of R, uh, A, x is less than equal to A. A is less than equal to x, which is strictly less than b. A comma b closed is equal to x is an element of r, conditioned on the fact that A is strictly less than x, which is less than equal to b. And then the closed interval, uh, A comma b, contains A and b. So it's going to be x is an element of r, the real number, such that A is less than equal to x, which is less than equal to b. Those are just some examples of set builder notation, uh, just to, to make sure we're just emphasizing, we're just beating, uh, beating the point. But you guys have seen intervals in some other class, like calculus or something, right? Maybe you've seen this notation. Awesome. So uh, let's talk about subsets now. The set builder notation is usually the most common way to, to define a set. Uh, a subset. We, uh, um, if A and B are sets, we write A is a subset of B, and we use this, this notation. This is kind of like a less than or equals to, but it's an open curly C. It's a big open sideways U. You know, it's not like a V, right? It's like, let me emphasize the curve on that. Yeah, like that. We write A is a subset of B, and this is read as subset. Uh, if, uh, for all x, that x is in A implies that x is in B. Every element of A is one that is an element of B. That's what it means to be a subset, right? Um, we write... Uh, a is a strict subset, and we either use this notation, which is really just my own personal flair. You see a sideways u, but then you put a strike through uh, through the equal equals part. Or you may write this as a uh, strict subset of B without the line to mean that uh, this is equivalent to A is a subset of B and uh, A does not equal B. Two sets are equal if they have the same elements. We'll define equality of sets uh, in a little more detail later. But what we mean by the strict subset is that it's a subset, but it is uh, a strict one. Every element in A is a subset of B, but they're not equal. Some element of B is not contained in A. Right? Um, let's do some examples of this. Uh, the integer, the positive integers are a subset of the naturals. Do we agree? Are these two sets equal, or are, is this a strict subset? Why? Uh, there's no negative numbers in either of those sets. Zero. Zero is a natural. Zero is not a positive integer. Um, what is the relationship between the naturals and the integers, though? A strict subset or a subset? Strict, strict. Yes, there are negative numbers which are not naturals. So not only is this a subset, but it's a strict subset. Um, now, what is the relationship between the naturals and the rational? Excuse me, the integers and the rationals? It's a strict subset as well. Now, technically, we write a rational as a pair of numbers. But you can map A is in uh, the integers. Uh, you could say that A over 1 is an element of the rationals, right? So every natural uh, can be written as a rational number, right? Um, now, what do we know about the rational numbers? There are, 
what's the relationship between the rational numbers and the real numbers? Strict subset? Why do we know it's strict? What's give me an irrational number? Pi squared to 2e. Those numbers are real. They're not uh, rational. Yet, by definition, every rational is a real number. right? And then simply, again, by definition, every real number is complex. But not every complex is real, certainly. Right, this is also strict because i is uh, complex and definitely not real. By definition, it's imaginary. Um, what about, uh, we may also write the open interval a comma b. What relationship does the open interval a comma b have with the closed interval a comma b? And again, the closed interval here is less than or equal to a and b and greater than or equal to uh, x is less, greater than or equal to a or less than or equal to b. For the open interval, a is strictly greater than a or strictly less than b, and strictly less than b, right? What relationship do, we, do these two have in terms of sets? Strictly sets. It's a strict subset. Why is it a strict subset and not just a subset? Um, because... Uh, the right-hand side contain A and B, but not the left-hand side. Yeah, there's an element in this one that's not in this one. A and B themselves, right? And I'll also tell you that this is also a strict subset of the, of the open interval A minus 1, B plus 1. Convince yourself of that. That interval, if you think about it geometrically, is bigger, right? It's like, that's AB. That's open. That's closed, and then we got that one, right? So it's a closed interval inside of an open interval, some larger open interval, right? Okay. Um, for which sets is the empty set a subset of S? For which S is the empty set a subset of S? Every set. Every set. Every set contains the empty set as a subset. Let's prove it. We'll prove it in two ways. Uh, we prove for all sets S that the empty set is a subset of S. Okay? Here's two proofs. First, consider the set uh, A. Okay? A, let A be the set defined with set builder notation such that X is an S such that 5X. Okay? Just with set builder notation, suppose you define the set A. What do you know about A by definition? If A is defined, is, the elements are from the set X subject to a generic predicate, phi, which we'll talk about later, what do you know? What is everything you know about A? Anything possible you know about A? A is a, a set. A is what? A set. A set. A is a set. That is correct. But what, are, what, uh, what else do we know about A? I'll tell you, by definition, because every element of A is an element of S, you could say that A is a subset of S. You agree? Just by definition, every, no matter what phi is, it doesn't matter what phi is, whatever phi is, it's a restriction on the elements of S themselves. So every X can, by definition, the way we've written it, is a subset of A, including for the predicate phi of x is such that uh, x is not an element of s, 
right? So if A is the set, A is a subset of S, and we know that X is an S only if uh, X is not an S, what is A? We know that no matter what the predicate is, A is a subset of S, but what is A? A, a contains elements such that A is an S if X is not an S, right? So what are the elements of A? Nothing. There is, it's impossible for an element to be both an element of S and not an element of S, right? Nothing can be both in and not in a set. So by definition, A contains no elements. And A has no elements. So A is equal to the empty set. And from there, we can simply conclude that the empty set is a subset of S, right? Um, here's a second proof uh, by uh, vacuousness. We know that P implies Q is vacuously true if P is false. This is called being vacuously true. It's just sort of if the premise is not even addressed, then the statement is true. It's just sort of like for these sort of edge cases and base cases, you have to, we've made a distinction as, as mathematical community where the cards fall. And we decided that P implies Q will be true if P is false, right? Recall that's the truth table. Um, and by definition, the empty set is a subset of S if and only if, and we gave the definition of what it means for a subset uh, to be defined. Uh, for all x, x is an element of the empty set implies x is an element of S, right? That's the definition of s A is a subset of B, right? Um, but for all x, it is not true that x is an element of uh, the empty set, right? So, so P is false. The statement is vacuously true. Statement is vacuously true. That means DVD. The empty set is a subset of every set. The empty, when you think of a subset, you think of a selection of the elements. Maybe you have some constraints on them. Maybe you have the set of numbers and you want to choose only the set of numbers divisible by three. You know, something like this. It's some, you can think of a subset as a restriction. And the empty set certainly is a restriction of every set, is where you choose no elements. So you may uh, take that the empty set is a subset of every set. Uh, sometimes you may see this notation. And it's bad, bad practice to use that. Basically, it means that A is a superset. A is a superset of B. If you see this notation, uh, run. But basically, this is true if and only if uh, B is a subset of A. Right? Just flip the whole thing around. B a subset of A means A is basically smaller. B is smaller than A. If you see it this way, again, B is smaller than A. But a is greater than B, right? Unlike when you do numbers, right? If you do numbers, you do, you know that for all, all numbers x greater than y, or x equals y, or uh, x is less than y, this is a tautology, right? For any numbers, any two numbers can be compared, either real numbers or uh, uh, natural numbers or whatever. These are, this is like the most important property of the numbers. Is given any two numbers, you can compare them. One is greater than the other, or they're equal. That's always true. But that's not necessarily for, true for sets. This is a tautology, but this is not. Um, a is a subset of B, or A equals B, or uh, B is a subset of A. That's not true for any two sets. Give me two incomparable sets. Set contain, uh, imagine, oh, no, set, set contain rational and set contain irrational. 
That would be that's perfect. The set containing I'll do a simpler example, and we'll talk about that in a second. Neither of those are subsets of the other, and they're not equal. So this is, in general, not a tautology, right? Like he says, the set of the, 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 the rationals and the irrationals are also incomparable, right? You can't say for certain one is a subset of the other. It's not always true. Now, for numbers, any two numbers may be compared in this way. S that's not true for sets. Only some sets may be, be, be compared. It depends, right? But it's not true for all sets. Questions so far on subsets, power set, uh, not subsets, subsets, strict subsets? Let's talk about cardinality. Uh, the cardinality is basically the number of elements. Uh, you write, for, for A as any set, you write uh, the bars of A to be uh, the number of elements in A, right? The abs this would mean think of it as like absolute value, but it's not absolute value. It means the cardinality of A, where A is the, n it's the number of elements that are in A. Um, uh, if A is finite, then the cardinality of A is an element of what? The natural numbers. The natural numbers. Yeah. Um, what is the cardinality of the set containing 2, 3, 4? 3. three. There's three elements in there. Uh, what is the cardinality of the natural numbers? Trick question. Uh, there's infinitely many natural numbers. Uh, so we did, there's actually several kinds of infinity. Uh, let's not think about that right now, though. So we'll just saw, say that's, oh, it's infinite, and let's leave it at that. We won't talk about the different infinities or anything, but just know that that's, that may be the case. What about, um, what is the cardinality of the empty set? Zero. Zero. There's no elements in it. What about... Um, the cardinality of the set containing the naturals. One. One. This is a trick here, but it, understand the set. This is a set containing one element. That one element is a set containing infinitely many elements. So this is different than this, right? This is a set of, that's infinite, that, containing infinitely many elements. This is a set of one element, but that one element is itself a set containing infinitely many elements. Sets may contain each other. That's kind of important. The set containing the empty set, the set containing a comma b comma c, and the set con and contains two. This is technically a set, right? The universe of discourse of this set is sets and subsets of a, b, c, and numbers, right? Something weird. But it's not, there's nothing wrong with this. A set can contain, the elements of a set could themselves be sets, right? All right, uh, any questions on cardinality, right? It's simply the number of elements in a set. Let's talk about uh, the Cartesian product. Uh, if A and B are sets, we write A times B this big cross in between it, to mean, using set builder notation, pairs x, y such that x is an A uh, for all x, I'll use for all, for all x, x is an A, uh, and x is an B, excuse me, and, and uh, for all y, y is an B. It's basically all possible pairs of elements uh, in A, and it is in B. Now, when we use a parenthesis like this, we mean a tuple. 
is a tuple, like a, like a double or a triple or a quadruple, right? That's where the name tuple comes from. It's a finite, uh, you, can't, you, can't have an, you cannot have an infinitely long tuple, and a tuple is ordered. So this does not equal y comma x, right? Think of a tuple most like a coordinate, right? It's not a set. A tuple is explicitly not a set. And we use, usually you'll use parentheses notation for a tuple. And a set, you use the cool mustache bracket, right? Um, what is the name of the Cartesian product of R with itself? There's a name you may have learned from another math class of this set. The uh, xy coordinate plane. Yeah, this is also called the Cartesian plane. Sometimes it's written as r squared. This is the Cartesian plane. <coughs> Let's do a simpler example. Let's do the set uh, 0, 1, 2 uh, times the set containing uh, 2, 3. And what we're going to do is you're going to take all pairs of things from the first and uh, pair it with all things from the second. So this is going to be a set containing the tuples uh, 0, 2, uh, 0, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, um, 2, 2, and 2, 3. Right? Uh, you may notice a pattern. Uh, if A and B are finite, what is the cardinality of A times B? A, B. If A and B are finite sets, the cardinality of the Cartesian product of A and B, the Cartesian product of A and B is all possible pairs from A paired with all possible elements of B. So. How many elements are going to be in the Cartesian product? The number of elements in the Cartesian product are going to be all possible pairs uh, for the first and the second, right? So it's here we had a, a three-element set and a two-element set. We, come, we Cartesian product them to get a six-element set, right? Questions so far on Cartesian product, on just the notation? Uh, everything is sets. Every function is actually just sets. Uh, it sets all the way up and down. Every time you've done a function, you've actually been working on a, on, on a set and have not realized it. <coughs> there aren't even numbers, and we'll talk about this on Thursday. Numbers don't exist. There are only sets, and we use sets to pretend that there are numbers. Numbers aren't real. Um, consider the function like uh, f of x is equal to x squared, right? When you talk about a function like this, you're actually, you may not have realized this, but you've actually been talking about a, a, a set. So we talk about uh, the subsets. Um, the graph of this function is going to be the pairs x comma y is an element of the Cartesian plane such that y is equal to x squared. Right? This is the set of points in the Cartesian plane that draw that function f of x is equal to x squared. So in fact, every function you can think of is actually just a subset of whatever universe of discourse it comes from, from the, from the Cartesian product of the, of the uh, domain and codomain. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk about functions later. But sets are so useful. Every function you've ever done is actually just a set. Now, usefully, maybe not. You can't take a derivative of a set or something like this. But set is a foundation for all of the rest of the math. You, you, it's, it's incredibly useful. Because um, when you have sets, you don't need anything else. You can define everything just using sets. Right. Uh, pop quiz, what is the Cartesian product of a set with the empty set? set. Yeah, this is the empty set. Why? With, if following the method of proof, things may be intuitively and obvious, but you should be able to explain uh, your reasoning to a child about why this is true. It certainly is true. I mean, it's definitely not anything. If it's anything at all, it has to be the empty set. But why is it the empty set? Cardinality. We could take the cardinality argument, and then we would have uh, a times 0. And the only set with no elements is then the empty set. That's one argument. But that may not be the best argument, because in fact, it's defined the other way. 
The, that is proved using this instead of this proved using that, right? So to avoid a circularity argument, what's another reason this is uh, the empty set? Because you have no y coordinates to plot on the Cartesian plane. Yeah, so just to be clear, the Cartesian plane only is for reals like this, but you can take the Cartesian product of any sets. But it's true, there is no, the, 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 again, the Cartesian product is defined as tuples um, x comma y such that x is in A and, and y is in the empty set. But there are no elements here, right? So vacuous, y is an element of the empty set. This is kind of, you can rewrite this as x is in A and something that's false, right? So if you think about it this way, x, what is, what happens when you and something with false? false. You just get false, so that you could, I'm over explaining vacuousness here. All pairs x, y, such that, false. So, I mean, there are no pairs x, y. Nothing is, uh, satisfies that. This is called vacuity. This is called vacuous. Something you may say is vacuously true because there is no deduction to be performed. The empty set contains no elements. Therefore, the, pro, uh, the Cartesian product of a set with the empty set contains no empty set, contains no elements. It's vacuous, right? The definition of the product relies on elements existing, and if no elements exist, then the Cartesian product also can have no elements, right? Yes? Why is that, why does that evaluate to false that y uh, belongs to the empty set? What y is in the empty set? No y exists. Uh, when we wrote it this way, it's like for all y, y is an element of b. But in fact, there does not exist y that y is an element of b. Right? So in fact, there does not exist a y. So we are pairing it for all possible y, but no y exists. So there's nothing to pair it with. That's another way to think. Questions so far? All right, let's talk about equal. When are two sets equal? When should two sets be? That's like, in, if we were to intuitively come up with a definition, when should two sets be equal? What does that mean? What does it mean for two sets to, set to, uh, two sets to be exactly the same? same they have the same elements. Two, set are, two sets are equal if they have exactly the same elements. So we can say two definitions of equality. One, we can say, uh, they have the same elements. So for all x, uh, we say a is equal to b, defined to be uh, for all sets a. How am I going to write this exactly? Let's see. I'll give you the. Uh, for all x, we say x is an a uh, implies. No, excuse me, x is in A if and only if x is in B. From that, that implies that A is equal to B. If it's true that for all x, that x is an element of A, if and only if x is an element of B, that implies that A equals B. It's called, this is an axiom of set theory, in fact. Definition of equality is given and not derived. But it's, there's another way to derive equality of sets using um, subsets, in fact. You can define equality of sets using subsets. How could you do so? A equals B, if and only if what? Maybe a little tricky for us, but let's see if anyone has an answer. A belongs to B and B belongs to A. Yeah. Not belongs to. We'll, uh, belong to will reserve for element of. Uh, but we'll, subsets. subsets, yeah. If A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now, 
Now, when you want to prove two sets are equal, this is actually a very useful tool. This is called double set containment. What you do is you prove A is a subset of B, and then you prove B is a subset of A. Now, in this class, when we do double set containment, it's usually trivial. But we want to, in practice, like a double set containment is the only way to prove equality of sets. Because if, what if A and B are infinite? How would you prove that? You can't really just show each element is, of one is the element of the other. That's not too easy. Because you can't even finish the proof of writing out the elements. In practice, two sets can be equal if they have the same elements. You do a double set containment. And maybe this is true for one reason, and this may be true for a completely different reason. But then if you show that one contains the other and the other contains it, then it could only be the case that they're equal. That's what that means. Right? So we can actually prove that uh, the double set containment uh, is true. Uh, now, how do you prove an if and only if? You have to do both ways. So we'll prove it. Uh, let's do the implies first. Uh, this is easy, in fact. Uh, if a is equal to b then uh, every element, of, then A is a subset of B, and uh, B is a subset of A, certainly, right? If A equals B, they have exactly the same elements. So every element of A is an element of B, so A is a subset of B. And if, every, if, if A equals B, then every element of B is also is an element of A. So by definition, uh, maybe I'll write it out for you. If A is equal to B, then every element of A is an element of B. So A is a subset of B. Also, every element of B is also an element of A. So B is a subset of A. Then those are both true, then we know that A is a subset of B, and B is a subset of A. <laughs> Obviously trivial, but I'm just trying to show how it follows from the definitions we've given of subset. Uh, how The other way is a little tricky, right? So if we get to assume, assume uh, that A is a subset of B, and b is a subset of a. Then, for all x, uh, x is in a implies that x is in b. And for all x, x is in b implies that x is in a. Right? So, uh, x for all x, it's true that x is in A if and only if x is in B. By definition, uh, this implies uh, A is equal to B. Right. Questions on that? Kind of an over-explanatory proof, but perhaps uh, it's a useful exercise to see as many proofs as possible. All right, one more uh, set thing to do, and then we'll take our little break. Uh, for S, any set, define the power set of S to be equal to uh, the set of all subsets of S. So notice that 
uh, A is a subset of S if and only if, by definition, A is an element of the power set of S. The power set of S is the set of all subsets of some set S, whatever that set is. So for example, what is the power set of the set containing 1, 2? The set of 1 and 2 the empty set? The empty set, the set containing 1, the set containing 2, and the set containing 1, 2. Right? The empty set is a, set of, is a subset of every set. Every set is a subset of itself, right? That's true for all A, technically. They're equal, so. Uh, the power set then contains the set of all subsets. So here, this, this set contains four elements. In general, what is the cardinality of the power set of S? For S, any set. Let's say S be a finite set. What is the cardinality of the power set of S? This one takes a second. One more, say it one more time. Factorial plus one. It is a big number, but it's not factorial plus one. So two factorial plus one, is that, is that you got that three? Two factorial plus one would be, this is two. There's two elements here. There's four elements here. So that would be 2 factorial would be 2 plus 1 is 3. So that doesn't work for this one. Is it 2 to the cardinality? Correct. This is 2 to the cardinality of s. Why is that true? It's beyond us to prove it right now. We'll be able to prove it twice with some more advanced techniques. And when we get more into combinatorics, we'll talk about how to count the number of sets of something. But basically, every element either is or isn't in a subset. right? So if you add an element here, it's twice the previous size. So every time you add an element to the set, it doubles the number of possible subsets, something like this. You can also map the number of subsets to binary strings, whether or not it contains an element or doesn't contain an element. Right? So it's the number of binary strings of length, the number of elements, which is going to be 2 to this cardinality of s as well. We'll prove this later. But just know that there's a lot of subsets. Um, what is the power set of the empty set? Almost. The set, of the, empty set. the set containing the empty set. It's the set of all subsets. So it's a set containing whose el the, it's, the power set is a set. The elements of the power set are those which are subsets of the set. Now, the only set that's a subset of the empty set is itself. Because in fact, this, the empty set is a subset of every set. What is the power set then of? The power set, let's try the power set of the power set of the empty set. Well, that's just going to be the power set of the set containing the empty set, which is different than the empty set, right? This has no elements in it. How many elements are in this set? One. One element, which itself is a set of no elements. That's the way that falls. What is the power set of the set containing the empty set? Um. Name one element in this set first. Let's go one at a time. What is an element of the set containing the empty set? Just the, empty set. the empty set is an element. By the way, the empty set will always be an element because it's true that if A is a subset of S, then A is an element of the power set. The empty set is a subset of every set. So the empty set is an element of every power set. So every power set will always contain the empty set. What is another element of the power set? The set of empty set. The set of empty set. The set containing the empty set. All right, is there anything else? No. In fact, this contains one element, so the power set should contain two to the one elements. So there's two elements there, so we're good. That's not a nice looking set, it's kind of ugly. But in fact, uh, it's such an atomic basic set. The set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. That's how you would read that set. OK? 
kind of interesting. All right, uh, let's take a little break.